Scripture of today is found in Psalms, Psalms 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they have no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes to all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chambers, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes a circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived from its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy, making rise wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is a great reward. Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sin. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent from great transgressions. May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. As we go to prayer today, let's remember Sarah and Kyle Walden. Judy Hall, and Kim Sprangler. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this great service that we're in. We thank you for your house, Father, that we can come to and lay our troubles down. We ask, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit will come upon us today. Lord, when we need you and we cry out to you, you are always there. No matter if we are sinning, you're always waiting in the wings, Father, to catch us. Oh, Father, we just ask that uh, you use Anthony today as he preaches. Let your Holy Spirit speak through him and come into our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. A film projector is a storyteller. It does this by taking a film reel that consists of thousands of images. Light is then passed through each frame, projecting an image onto a canvas. These images in sequence can tell us a powerful story of happiness, sadness, or even humor. Our lives in many ways are like a film projector. Every action we take and word we speak builds the narrative of a story God is wanting to tell through us. Even though we all have different backgrounds, we have a choice of what we will project when the light of God shines through us. So what would someone see if they watched the movie of your life? Would they see light or darkness? Would they see life or death? Would they see love? Would they see grace? Would they see faith? Would they see Jesus? That was a very sweet video. So Jason normally picks these bumper videos, and I was honestly expecting, I was like, hey, can you pick one? And he looked at me yesterday, and he's like, yeah, I can pick one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was expecting to get ripped in some way. And even after it was very clear that the video was like, oh, this is a nice, lovely video, I was still waiting at the end for like, uh, for grace and love and peace, and the youth pastor's dumb. Like, <laughs> I was like, it's coming, I know it is. But no, that was a, was a very sweet video. Uh, I see some faces that I don't necessarily recognize, so I'm just going to say this to the front. My name's uh, Anthony St. Ives, I'm the youth pastor here at New Life. Uh, I'm glad to be up here again, which for those of you who are the regulars might be wondering, didn't we just see you like two weeks ago? Uh, <laughs> Uh, which, to answer a question that might be in your mind, no, this isn't an apology for last week. Uh, 
This isn't to bring the time back down again. Uh, it was a long sermon, but God spoke last week, did he not? Amen. So like he said, at sermon length, whatever it is, if the Spirit's moving, we're going to be here as long as he keeps us here. Uh, that being said, today will be not as long, I can guarantee that. Uh, I did joke with Jason uh, last week, though, that uh, last, last time I spoke, was I spoke for 34 minutes, was about what, how long my sermon was. That was the biggest, uh, longest time I'd ever preached in big church. Uh, big church. If, if you're a youth pastor and you stop calling it big church and you just start calling it church or service or whatever, that's the point you need to step out. That's, you're no longer a youth pastor. Uh, but then Jason had to come in, you know, the week after, weeks after, and triple my time, so <laughs> just had to one-up me or three-up me. Uh, but it was an amazing service, and God has just been moving through these services so much lately, and I'm just so grateful to be up here again. Uh, the main reason I am up here this week is to help out, actually, Jason and Amy a little bit to hopefully, uh, so they don't lose their sanity this week, as my wife said, Drew and Lana's wedding is this week. Uh, and as all of you who have been married and gone through weddings, the week of the wedding, easy, breezy, no stress. Yeah. Uh, just chill and relax. Uh, but no, I'm glad I could be up here to help Jason out. And uh, I am excited to be up here. I know I used to always talk about how nervous I used to be when I get up here, but I do enjoy being up here now. And it's, it's such a fulfilling and gratifying thing, personally, just to be able to be up here. And that I've been given the honor to do this and the call to do this. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, before we jump in to today's sermon, I just want to say a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here today to sing songs and worship in your name. And Lord, I pray as I give this message today that I remember, Lord, that it's, it's not my message, it's not uh, my words, Lord, but that I preach what you have for them today and that I can just stand out of the way and whatever you want to communicate today, Lord, just let it flow through and let hearts be open and ears be open to hear what you have. In your holy name we pray, amen. So today we will be continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this series we started about five weeks ago, which means, uh, according to Jason's timeline, we're about 10% through. Uh, but if you've missed any part of it, I urge you go back, catch up on the Facebook page. Uh, it's worth it. The series has been incredible. Uh, the series will only continue to get better and better. Uh, if you need help finding Facebook or YouTube, come find me or uh, any person under the age of 30. Uh, we should be able to help you out. Uh, this week, we will be moving on to the next Beatitude, uh, but before we dive into the scripture, uh, I want to start messages, how I often do, and that's what the question. So who are my people, show of hands, this youth group style, who are my list makers? My wife. Who are people when it's like, oh, I've got 900 tasks, I have to write them down, I have to get them on a list, otherwise I won't be able to do it. Uh, people who when they're, or when the Words are hard sometimes. People, when they're given a task or a group of tasks, you know you have to first organize your thoughts on a list. If you uh, don't know what I mean, uh, I'll give some examples from personal life or like what I, my mom's a list maker. Uh, and so she would, if it was clean the house, it's okay, we got to clean the kitchen. And then we, okay, then we have to move on to taking out all the trash, uh, do the recycling because we were in California, so there was a whole recycling thing we had to do. Uh, and then do the bedrooms, do the laundry, and just writing that all out. Or... Uh, my dad also kind of sometimes tended to be a list maker. I remember growing up, he built a deck that was like half height for our pool, kind of growing up around it, and he had a whole list of like, okay, got to get gravel, 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 got to level it, uh, then I got to get the, the supports in place, and I got to do this and this. And I remember seeing him check things off the list as he was doing that project. Uh, I am not a list maker myself, although I recognize that through my life, it would have been definitely helpful to be one at certain points. Jason's shaking his head. Uh, <laughs> The most recent example I can think of is just this last week. We have a table tennis downstairs in the youth room uh, that's very well enjoyed and used. Uh, and somehow, in mysterious fashion, completely unknown, don't know how it happened, teenagers managed to lose or destroy most of the ping pong balls. It's not like them. Uh, and so Joseph, uh, Joseph Holt down here in the front, uh, came to me about three weeks ago. Uh, he is the best ping pong player in the group after me, uh, <laughs> and he said, hey, Anthony, we're running out. Like, the rest of these are dead or destroyed or gone. Can you go get some? And I was like, yeah, Joseph, I'll get some. 
Next week came by. Hey, did you get ping pong balls? Ah, I forgot, Joseph. I'm sorry. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll remember. Next time I go to Walmart, I'll go get some. And that continued for two more weeks, <laughs> uh, which is really embarrassing because for personal reasons and for church reasons, I was at Walmart 10 to 12 times in those three weeks. <laughs> and just each time I'd walk in, I'd walk out. Almost on the drive back to church, when I was almost at church, I'd remember, oh, yeah, ping pong balls. We eventually did get them, but only because I remembered at the last minute Julie hadn't left for youth group yet, and I was like, can you please stop and get ping pong balls? <laughs> Joseph may kill me. I fear him. Uh, <laughs> but speaking of my lovely wife, she is a list maker. She is uh, somebody who, it's, if there's more than two tasks, there's got to be a list. Uh, she has a list at home that is uh, a very Julie fashion. It's covered with sloths uh, all over the page, and it's got a bunch of different little boxes to organize it in. If you don't know, my wife's favorite animal is the sloth. Uh, I don't know what that says about who she picked to marry, but it sure says something. Uh, <laughs> uh, and for her, writing list works sometimes, it doesn't work other times. There's one of four things that happen when Julie writes a list. Uh, she writes it, feels motivated to complete it, uh, because the tasks in front of her seem more possible, and she goes and does it and tackles it in a day. Two, she writes the list, sees the sheer number of tasks that have accumulated over time on that list, becomes overwhelming, list never gets done. Three, writes the list, ADHD kicks in, forgets the list exists. <laughs> This happened just the other day where she was like, oh, yeah, I wrote, she just saw her notebook sitting on the counter, and she was like, oh, yeah, I wrote that two days ago. <laughs> uh, and no, none of the tasks were done on that. Uh, and four, in the process of writing the list, ADHD kicks in, forget she was writing the list, tasks go undone. <laughs> uh, but I don't think it's wrong to say that regardless of whether or not we're people who make lists or are regular list users, us being provided a list of things to do I would say a lot of people prefer, because then it, one, seems to bring order to the chaos of what's going on, especially if you know you're involved in a family project, like planning a wedding, or working on a project at home, or if you've just bought something and it comes with a set of instructions. Like, if you didn't have the set of instructions, trying to figure out how that thing goes together, like in a piece of Ikea furniture, good luck. <laughs> Those might as well just be random pieces of wood and screws that, if you try hard enough, you might make a rectangle thing that looks like a dresser. But it brings order to chaos. There's a mess of things that need to get done, but when you have controlled list of tasks, it makes, makes it easy to know what to do. Another way of saying it is just a list simplifies things down to what seems like the basics. Two, lists make us feel productive. Uh, when I asked my wife, I said, hey, what are some of the reasons you like making lists? She said, sometimes just writing the list feels like I've done a task already. I wrote the list. I've done my part today. <laughs> I just pray that the next day ADHD hasn't kicked in. Uh, but past that, it can make you feel like you're doing a lot when in reality you might have just not done that much, which sometimes, you know, is good for like house menial tasks. Sometimes all you have to do is just chip away at them over the week. Uh, and three, this feeds on our nature as people to feel accomplished. Who doesn't like feeling like they've done something and done something well? Like, it's like, hey, there might be 12 tasks left on this list, but I did three of them. I, I did something today. I'm feeling good. What's list makers? Because every time I talk to you guys about this, or my wife about this, what is the number one feeling in the world to you when you're working with a list? Crossing, the, crossing that thing off. It's just next, cross it off. Boom, did it. Trashed. Boom, did it. Crossing, crossing at least five things off my list. Boom, did it. Well, some of you might be wondering where I'm going with this today, but last week y'all hung in with a 10-minute rant about steak, so you can stick with me for you know, the least next couple of minutes. <laughs> it's here today where I want to jump into our beatitude for this week, which we'll find in Matthew 5.8, which reads... Oh, there it is. Matthew 5.8, which reads, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, what, pure, what the word pure and what purity is has meant a lot of things to a lot of different people over the course of human history. For the Jews of Jesus' time, a lot of it had to do with rituals, the requiring of uh, washing the body or dishes, clean hands. The things you did were the things that purified the things around you. 
uh, we can just see some of this being described in uh, Mark 7, 1 through 4. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of the disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they, are give, they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Not to mention all the other ones that Jewish society put amongst themselves, all the rituals and traditions and things of lists they had to check off. Uh, you could just talk about the food itself and how it had to be prepared, had to be the right kind of meat, had to be this, had to be that. Purity to them meant all these rituals and traditions being accomplished. But when we think of purity in modern context, what does our mind always first go to? It's, we say purity, and it always goes to sexual purity. We always talk about that first. That is the number one thing uh, that dominates the conversation in modern Christian talks about purity. Don't look at porn. Don't have sex before marriage. Uh, and don't have same-sex relationships. If you don't do those things, you're pure, untouched, clean. Do those three things, and it's all good. For a long time, I don't know how many remember this or if any of you partook in this, uh, who remembers purity rings? Anyone ever have one? Anyone ever wear one? You know, just on the left finger, I'm, I'm wearing this ring, and it was, what was it? It was a promise of abstinence. It was, I'm going to remain sexually pure, I'm going to maintain the covenant of marriage, and I will not have sex until marriage. Purity ring, a physical sign that you intended to stay abstinent. And the surface, that's a wonderful thing. Like, hey, look, it's all these people publicly making professions that, hey, I'm not going to follow the pattern of this world, but I'm going to stay pure. The problem is, it was just a ring. In 2016, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst did a study about the effective, effective nature of purity rings. What they found is that 18% of people who never wore one or who never made an abstinent pledge ended up becoming pregnant before marriage. 18%, so roughly one in every five uh, girl, got, girls or guys who made that pledge who, or who did not make that pledge ended up pregnant before they were married. So if purity rings were doing their job and doing the things that we thought they were going to do for us, you would imagine that our number for people who did make that pledge would be lower. And if any of you have any kind of foresight about what I'm talking about, you know that's not going to be the case. The study also showed 30% of people who did wear the rings and who did make that pledge ended up having a pregnancy before they were married. It's a 40% increase, pretty much. 12% more than people who didn't make the pledge. But it doesn't make sense, because we wore the ring. We did, we did the thing. We, we got, because typically, uh, at least when I was growing up, uh, my youth group gave purity rings out to kids who were entering high school, their freshman year, when the statistics showed that sexual promiscuity typically went up in teenagers. So they did a whole ceremony about giving the rings out and doing this. We wore the ring. We did the task. We should be good. But they didn't work. Clearly they didn't work. Clearly they failed more than they succeeded. Now there's a lot that goes into what makes that, what the research group it says make that statistic happen, why it's much larger. But the point is, is just doing the act of didn't change anything. For a long time now, the perception of the big C church, the church at large, has been that we're a people of list and rules that we are to follow. And if we follow them, we get to go to heaven with all the other good rule followers. And the reason that's the perception is that's because of how we act. Uh, I, once again, I'm not bashing the church. I don't want it to seem like I come across that way, but I think it's okay to be critical of who we are and where we've come from. And if we're being honest, that's exactly where we've come from. We think we can make people follow a list of rules. They will become pure and that they'll be saved. We try to pass laws around just, as long as we can get this rule in place, then it means that people won't be able to do this sin anymore. So we try to ban gay marriage, or back in the day, try to ban alcohol. We try to ban whatever the sin of the day is. Because we're like, well, if we just make, the, make everyone follow the rule, it'll be fine. We've saved them. We've done our ministry for the, for the month or the year or whatever decade we want to call it. We've done our part. Just look and act like we 
like we do, follow the rules, and you too can avoid going to hell. That is not an unfair look at the church in the last hundred years. There are many problems to this approach. The first being that this type of be- that is this type of behavior where the Bible tends to be used as a weapon against people. I'm not saying that we shouldn't call out the sin in our world, but the Bible should never be used as a tool to make someone feel less than. Even if we disagree with them, the Bible is not your literal sword to go around stabbing people as you see fit. The only difference between your sin and that of a drug addict or a prostitute or someone living in a same-sex relationship is nothing. It's equal. It's the same. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All includes us. We can tell people, including ourselves, to follow all the rituals and rules and ways to act, but if we never truly let God take our heart, then nothing will ever truly change. The biggest problem is that we can tell people to follow the rules. But rules don't change people. How many of you have a list of rules at work or amongst the house, and you're just like, well, now I'm fully on, like, if you worked in retail, like, now I'm fully on board with Walmart because I followed all the rules and I fully love the idea of being at Walmart. No, you follow the rules because you feel like you have to, but the moment you leave there, it's not like you're going to be at home, like, honey, you have to wear gloves when you're handling that food. (laughs) Because rules don't change who you are, they just change how you act when you're somewhere else. Matthew 5, 8 doesn't just say, blessed are the pure in action, or blessed are the well-intended, or for they will see God. No, it says, blessed are the pure in heart. It's not about these external things we do to justify ourselves. No level of hearing to rules will save you unless your heart doesn't belong to God. If we go further down in the chapter... Matthew 27 to 28 will read, You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in her in his heart. You could follow the rules. Great, you didn't cheat on your wife. You met the bare minimum. <laughs> That's great. Don't commit adultery. That's good. But you also have to address whatever is in your heart that might have brought that feeling up in the first place. If you do not have control over your heart, if you do not have, if just your heart's after this world, you are are eventually going to fail. We talked meekness. What is meekness? Power under control. Rules don't have much power on their own. There we go. In Matthew 23, 25 through 28, we read, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but the inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanliness. Uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous, but to others you but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. When we try to live a faith based life upon the righteousness of our actions, we will always fall short. The imagery of the passage before speaks volumes to that. This is called the seven woes in Matthew, where Jesus is basically calling out the hypocrisy of the people of the day. Uh, If you only clean the outside of the bowl, the food you put on the inside still gets tainted. There's still dirty food. There's still something in there that's going to corrupt what you're putting in. It can appear as nice and beautiful on the outside as you want, but it's only ever going to be dirty and tainted on the inside. And the people who eat from that bowl, oh yeah, sure, it looks lovely, but they'll only ever be worse off for having consumed what comes out of it. We could be a whitewashed tomb looking beautiful and pearlescent and wonderful on the outside, but on the inside only contain the bones of the dead. A fitting analogy for a heart that lacks God if I've ever heard one. We can be these buttoned up, 
well-dressed, well-manicured, clean, flawless-looking, well-haircut, all these Bible-thumping Christians who each day and week runs through the checklist of things. Read my Bible, check. Prayed, check. Gave my tithe, check, check. Signed up for the bake sale, check. All right, God, I got all my checks done for the week. I'm such a good Christian. I've done my things for this week. Some of you remember when I spoke a few weeks ago, I mentioned the young rich ruler where he says, God, what do I have to do to get heaven? And God says, honor your mother and father. And he gives him a list of things. And the young rich ruler is like, yeah, nailed it, killed it, doing that. What else do I got to do? And then Jesus gave him a task that questioned his heart. He had been adherent to the law. He had done what he was supposed to, but his heart was nowhere near the right place. So he went away sad because he knew that the task being called to him was too great. Rules did not save him when his heart needed to be right. But if your mind and heart still belong to the world, if you're still longing after carnal pleasures, or you're still obsessed with earthly comforts, if you still look down upon the downtrodden and broken in the world, if you do not extend grace to those who disagree with you or who may hate you, then you do not have a pure heart because you got through the list of Christian check marks. In Proverbs 16.2, we read, All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the Spirit. And in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, we read, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God weighs what the heart holds. No amount of external polish, no amount of external doings or actions will change what God sees when he looks into the heart of man. The image of God is a phrase we talk about a lot, but the image of God isn't just a merely appearing to look somewhat like Jesus on the outside, but it's being Jesus to the core of who you are because when you have your heart changed, everything you do extends from that. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying obeying the tenets and the commandments of the Bible isn't what we should be doing. Clearly, we are a church who heavily preaches the Bible, follow God's commandments, follow what he calls us to in this life. What I am saying is that if the heart behind those actions is just as, if not more important. Everything we do, everything we are, comes out of from who we are in here to the world. Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Being pure in heart doesn't just mean your physical actions. It means having a heart focused on growing closer to God each day, about letting him have full and entire control of our life. We let go of who we are and we let God make us into what we need to be. When we try to attain purity by going through the list of things, it's just going through the old rigmarole. We make our faith transactional. That's the only way you can look at it. Hey God, I did the things you asked. I believe that means I earned heaven now. Some of you can test that if you want, but on the day where you're being judged and you go up to the gate and you're like, but I did all the checklists. You're going to get looked at and go, yeah, but why? And for who? And for what? But if God just wanted little minions to complete menial tasks each day, he would have made little robots that were programmed to go out and do certain things. That's not what he did. He made you and me. He made people willing and able to make their own choices. And he does that with the hope that you will choose to love him back because he loved you first. He longs for those people to choose to love him. Our faith is not a transaction. It is a relationship with the one who created us, one who loved us long before we existed and who will love us long after we're gone. So yes, follow the commandments. Yes, we pray. Yes, we read our Bible. Yes, we tithe. 
But we should do those things not because we were told to, but because they come out of who we are. It shouldn't just be, I'm compulsed to feel, follow the rules to avoid hell. I feel compulsed to do this because my heart is after God's own heart. And these are convictions upon who I am. Not convictions of an external pressure that you're worried that if you don't tithe enough, the church isn't going to like you, or if your church doesn't see you praying enough, that they're not going to accept you, but that you want to grow so close to God and you want to be so after his own heart that you know you need to do this and you do them out of love. A heart that longs for nothing in this world or a heart that longs for something this world can offer will always lack something, but a heart that lacks for nothing this world can offer, but only seeks God is a heart that will, as the verse says at the end, will see God. So how do we purify our heart? It's the trick of it. We don't. <laughs> the only thing we could truly take our heart and purify it of all our worldly desires is God, which means we have to approach him in humility. We have to come to him in eagerness. And say, God, I no longer want what this world has for me. God, I know I've tried doing all these things to justify my existence and justify myself before you. But no matter what I do, I will fail. God, you have to take this heart. I give it over to you. Clean it of my desires of this world. Take me. Make your will my will. Let all of what I do flow out of a heart that mimics God's. Because to steal an image that's been used a lot over the last few weeks, if we want to get right here, this, you have to first get right here. Because everything will flow from that. And in that, we get to see the wonderful and glorious work of God at work in the world around us constantly. The last part of the verse, for they shall see God. Of course, he's not talking about a physical seeing of God. We know that we wouldn't be able to sustain that. We see how Moses tried to do the same thing and just seeing his back was more than enough for a single human. We won't see him with our eyes, but his presence around us will become known. His will for your life will become clear. There is no greater joy that you will ever experience in your life than watching the work of God in the world around you. Let your lists and desires give way to God's glory in your life. In a moment here, we're going to sing a song. Uh, we'll be singers up here today. You guys can sit, you can stand, you can do whatever you, you wish. We're going to serve communion. And... I'm going to ask that the people handing out communion come forward at this point. We're going to get together to gather the elements and participate in the sacrament in honoring what Jesus did for our life because his heart was pure. And if it wasn't for that, he would have never gotten on the cross. But he had a heart after God's own heart. But also in that time, if you're here today and you need to come pray the prayer, you need to come ask God, please purify this heart. Take the control out of my hands. Stop letting me try to convince myself that no matter how much good I do, that I am nothing if I am not doing it in you and for you. If you need to come pray that prayer today, please, during communion, at any time, the altars are open. We would love to come pray with you. We'd be honored to come pray with you. So as we come to communion and the next song plays, pray, contemplate. When you're ready, come gather the elements. Amen. God is good. Amen. Um, so you guys got a break this week, a little shorter, um, finishing an hour earlier than we did last week. I know some of you will be happy, Ray. Um, but hey, we love you guys. And, and Anthony did a, a wonderful job. The, the, the spirit is moving in this church. I think that's evident everywhere we look. I hear from you guys that you're you're having conversations with people that are far from God, and that is, that is what we are praying for here, that the Holy Spirit would move and that his light and his spirit would flow through us, and we would just be a vessel of mercy and his grace, and, and he is doing that, and he is going to faithfully continue to do that. We are having a potluck, lunch, some of you call it dinner, 
uh, but a potluck lunch after church. If you didn't bring anything, go ahead and stay. Get to know some people. Um, this is a great group of folks. We are weirdos just like you, so stay. Get to know us, all right? Um, let, let's pray, and we'll, we'll get out of here. Father, oh, you are so good. You are so faithful, Lord, that you move through. You speak through us, God, just ordinary men and women, Father, that we are grateful for what you're doing in this church, Lord, and what you're going to do in the Lake community. So, Lord, we, we pray that you keep us, that you guide us back to that place of a pure heart, Lord. When we want to drift, when we want to do our own things, when we want to check down the list, God, that you remind us to get back where we need to be, Lord, in, in your presence. So, Father, we pray for this meal, God. We, we ask you to bless this food, nourish our bodies. Um, we, we pray for fellowship, that, that holy moments would happen even downstairs, God, in our conversations. And we, we, we're going to continue to pray that you rise up, Lord, a generation of leaders and preachers and prophets, God, that you are not done moving in this world. So we're going to just pray for you to continue to move in the hearts of your servants here, Lord, men and women. We love you, God. And as we go out into this community this week, Lord, might we just be wrapped in you, Lord, covered in your spirit, God, that we might be an empty vessel that just takes you everywhere we go. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to go downstairs and eat. Um, I do want to, I want to thank you. If you support the ministry of New Life Church here, there is an offering box in the back. Someone has a car alarm going off. Um, not sure who that is. But, hey, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May his face shine upon you. Have a great week.